They do know one point in the mapping. They do know the status quo, so to speak. All right, so there's a point, it's producing some outcome, they know what that is. And so I'm assuming that, uh, that the point they know is, is zero, and so they know the value of psi zero. They know the outcome of the status quo policy. All right, so this is, if this psi of zero is not equal to zero, there's an asymmetry in our knowledge here. We know one point that might give a liberal outcome or, or a conservative outcome. All right, so in a sense, what I'm doing is just generalizing the old framework of Roma Rosenthal, where there's a status quo that's non-centrist, right, and they're kind of looking at an agenda game. I'm going to look at a, at a different game. All right, but kind of adding to it the idea that we have a status quo outcome, so that means we're going to know more information about that policy right, and less information about policies we haven't tried yet. All right, so that's where our uncertainty is. So with two candidates or two politicians and two periods, there are four possible sequences of political power. Uh, I should click forward. DD, DR, RD, and DR. I'm going to take a particular sequence as given here. All right, and so therefore the hold on power is deterministic. All right, so I'm just going to kind of look at particular sequences of power. I'm not going to model the election. The voter here isn't going to be a strategic actor. I'm just going to say, Here's the sequence, what are the policy choices of the players in either period? All right, this is, makes my life simpler. It's not essential. And one other benefit of it is that it really differentiates this story from the disciplining story. All right, so what the politician who's in power in the first period does has no effect on their re-election probability. All right, so there's no kind of threat of re-election trying to maximize your chance of re-election. You're certain to lose power or you're certain to retain power. I'm going to look at what the policy choice in those different sequences are. Yeah, so I could add discounting and it's, it's not going to essentially change the results. Substitute the, the term in. Yeah, well, I think the answer is yes, but we'll come back to it. Okay, so to give you a little more idea here, and I, I promise to give you some pictures to explain things, here's just a kind of representation of the framework I'm going to be looking at. All right, so we're choosing policies on this space, and the policy space is the set of integers off the positive and negative infinity. And there's going to be a function that maps policies into outcomes, where the set of possible outcomes is the set of integers as well. All right, so for gamma equals one, we're going to have a Republican has an ideal outcome of one, the Democrat has an ideal outcome of negative one, and the voter who I'm going to consider for the welfare implications on the voter is at zero. All right, so it's just a voter with guys on the politicians on either side. But what they care about directly are the outcomes, and they have then indirect preferences over the policies. All right. So, what, as I said, there's a, ma there's a function that maps policy to outcome, and that function is the realized path of a random walk. All right, so there's some function that's going through this space that takes policies and maps them into outcomes. All right, and so it could look like this, or it could look like that, all right, depending upon how nature draws it at the beginning of play. Now here I've drawn it for the status quo outcome, psi of zero is equal to negative one. So all the players know is that it passes through this point here, they don't know the rest of the shape of the function. All right, that's their policy uncertainty. They could choose the status quo and always get a certain outcome, but other policies, they don't know what outcome they're gonna get until they try it. All right, so in fact, you know, they know it passes through this point, the function could have stepped up to this value with probability q or it could have stepped down with probability 1 minus q. All right, so that's the kind of this, the random walk. We're stepping up at, with probability q or stepping down and that's holds between any two policies. All right, so from the perspective of the, of the players here, they know the mapping passes through zero negative, well, under, assuming this is the status quo outcome, they know it passes through this point and they only can form beliefs about what the other policies are going to produce. All right, so with probability Q, they believe they're up here. With one minus Q, they're down there. And as we move across on the policy space, we're kind of broadening out the range of possibilities. With two steps, we could be up here. And these are just binomial probabilities, Q squared. With one minus Q squared, we're down here. And with two Q, one minus Q, we're there. All right, so as we move further away, the range of possible outcomes is getting bigger and our uncertainty is increasing. Now, because Q is greater than a half, the expected value as we move is increasing. And I've got a discrete policy space, but you can think of that as points on this line. The expected value is moving up. So as we move the policy to the right, the expected outcome is 
becoming more and more conservative. All right, and as I said before, the, and you can see quite clearly, the range and the variance is increasing as I move further away from what I know. All right, so there's some nice properties to representing uh, the policy mapping this way. All right, and so the key part of the talk here is to convince you that this is a reasonable way to model this. All right, so what it's implying is that the players can order policies according to expected outcomes, but not according to actual outcomes. All right, so the expected outcomes, as I said, is just bait all the points on this line here. So they know as they move to the right, in expectation, they're getting a more conservative outcome. All right, but they don't know that the realization follows that same ordering. All right, and so the fact that it, the realized outcomes may be different from the expected outcomes, it's kind of capturing, I think, this law of unintended consequences. So I can move policy to the right and think I'm becoming, a, or in expectation, getting a more conservative outcome, but something surprising could happen. It could kind of screw up, and I could actually end up with a more liberal outcome, or vice versa. All right, so that's the risk of policy making. I don't know how to in this necessarily get what I want. All right, and I risk uh, actually making things worse. Now, of course, I'm thinking of an ideological space with left, right here. But you could easily think of this as an efficiency space that I'm trying to get a more efficient outcome. I screw it up, and it, and it becomes less efficient. All right, and the uncertainty is of the outcomes is increasing as I move in distance from what's known. All right, so I know one point I can make a little change to policy and there's a little uncertainty, which seems reasonable. But if I try to make a big change from what I know, I've got a, a lot of uncertainty there. And so the risk is increasing. All right, and I can also think of the, and the, the, the amount of that risk is dependent upon the parameter Q. And so I can think of the complexity of the underlying issue as being inversely proportional to Q. And so as Q approaches one, I'm almost certainly moving on this line up here. And so I can predict pretty accurately about what's going to happen when I change policy. But for Q near a half, there's a lot more variance. It's bouncing around. I'm a lot less confident. I understand the process a lot less. And so there's a lot more risk involved in policy making. All right. So we could talk uh, for a quite a while more about these properties, but it's a different way of representing policy uncertainty here in a rich policy space. And what I've would like to convince you of is that it's a, it's a reasonable and, and an appropriate way to represent that. All right, so now I'm going to look at what are the incentives of politicians to choose policies when power alternates between, say, a Democrat and a Republican. All right, so to give you a quick rundown of the kind of results I'm going to present, in case people do fall asleep, I'm going to start with a benchmark result of just, and it's a trivial result to say, what happens when we know the policy mapping completely, when there's no uncertainty? All right. Then I'm going to say, well, suppose we don't know the mapping, and I'm going to consider the simplest case I can find, which is minimal polarization or minimal ideological difference. So this is saying gamma is equal to 1. So this is saying the Democrats' ideal outcome is negative 1, the Republicans is 1. All right, and the point I know is actually equal to the Democrats' ideal. And so this is going to be the simplest case. I'm going to give you pictures. It's going to capture the, the intuition and the logic of the result. 